So I'm going to kick off the recording and begin the meeting here at 10.03. I want to thank everybody for joining us, you know, and other folks have come on where we are recording this, right, so that we can have this available for, you know, for folks uh, um, later on. Um, uh, so if it, uh, 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 you know, so just a heads up uh, on that. Um, I wanted to begin, obviously, just with some, you know, some comments and perspectives here and a huge thank you to everybody who participated in the garden tour. Um, I know, um, uh, Sharon coolish Bales, you've got the detailed financials on this, uh, 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 but I mean, we're looking at, you know, over $7,000, right, you know, of net income coming out of uh, Saturday, July 24th. So it's just a, a huge, you know, uh, increase in years from, from years past. And of course, given COVID and the COVID restrictions, I mean, this is a, you know, a phenomenal accomplishment. I see Rhonda is on, Terry is on. Um, any comments, Terry, Rhonda, from the day, from the event? Well, yes, I would, I would just like to um, once again, uh, marvel at our volunteers. Um, I, I actually went through and counted up the number of volunteers who worked all the various parts of the garden tour and the plant sale. And we had 63 of our members help out with this big project that we do called a garden tour, which I just think is astonishing and so <laughs> incredibly wonderful, 63. Um, so, you know, I mean, it starts with, with three of our members who volunteered their garden, but then there were, um, there were um, um, five members who did publicity, um, Mary, Katie, Rick, Shushila, and me. And uh, of course there was Robin and, and Rhonda who did just a fantastic job of turning our plant sale into a mini garden uh, show. So, you know, I mean, there, there were many parts to, to what made this successful. Um, and uh, I just can't th thank our, our members enough. Also, uh, we always do this survey card, which um, I, I think probably sometimes seems a bit like a burden, but this year we had uh, 27 potential master gardeners say they're interested in our 2022 training. Yes, so, good. Yeah, I, I thought that was really, um, really a great thing. And, and um, so it was a fantastic tour and, uh, and I just wanna thank everybody. Also, I wanted to show the present we gave our um, garden tour owners. It's a book that I really like myself and I actually wanted to steal the title for this garden tour because it reflects so much about um, the, the lovely, lovely landscapes that each of our uh, master gardeners has created. Um, so anyway, thank you all. Uh, but if you know of a garden, because this is the time of year when we try to find uh, the beginning of the next tour, if, if you know of uh, some beautiful gardens, I'd sure like to hear about them. Where do you want to, uh, where, where are you thinking about for next year? Is there a geography you're looking at? Uh, well, we haven't done uh, Hoquiam, Aberdeen, um, Central Park. Um, uh, Cosmopolis. We haven't done that area in quite a while, so that might be a um, a good area to look at. Um, usually, at the beginning of of planning the next tour, we try and find um, a starting group, two or three gar outstanding gardens somewhere, and then look for uh, more in that surrounding area. So. Um, I would encourage any of our members, uh, because uh, many of our members have really cool gardens, to, um, to raise your hand and say that you'd like to be on a garden tour. It's, it's a really great experience and uh, it gives you a deadline to do many, many of the projects that are sitting there waiting on your uh, to-do list to get them all done because you have a deadline. So. Uh, please uh, let us know if, if, uh, if you'd like to be on a garden tour. It really is a rewarding experience.
You know, a, a shout out in that regard, Terry, to the fact that uh, yourselves, as well as others, contributed quite a bit of time in helping prepare, go that, that final stint, right, in getting ready for the tour. So you were, you know, you actually, you actually, uh, uh, as uh, uh, you know, you were, you were there to assist the homes, you know, the, the gardens in getting over that final hurdle. Well, I'm always happy to do that. I'm, I'm always happy, as some of our other members are, to have that uh, time in someone else's garden, that close-up look at helping that allows you uh, to kind of just see in more detail what's going on in a garden. So I think that's a worthwhile uh, spending of time. Sharon Coolish Bales, Rhonda, you're on as well. Any, of the, any other comments regarding the garden tour? If I can speak for a moment, can you hear me? Sure, yes. Okay. Um, I, I, what a thrilling event. I, and I will just reiterate what Terry said, and I won't go on, but I sent an email out to, uh, I'm hopeful I caught all the volunteers that helped me. And if I didn't, I, I apologize. But without the volunteers stepping up, it would never have happened. And the workload for a few of us would have turned into a nightmare. And I am just so appreciative. As I said in my letter, meeting with everybody again, putting names and faces together, the interns getting to experience what we do, the comments from the vendors as well as the uh, citizens who came and supported us was tremendous. And um, they gave lots of input, lots of advice. We found some of the issues that we had. I tend to focus on the things that went wrong and I need to stop doing that and focus on what went right. And what went right was it was a beautiful day. People supported us. I would like to have had more plants. So I think that focusing now and getting folks involved in growing plants for our next plant sale would be tremendous. And I'd love to help with that part of it. Whether we do it the same way or not is probably very questionable, but um, you know, we do the plant sale every year. So I can think of ways to grow that opportunity for us and hopefully I can be involved in that. But thank you everybody. Uh, yeah, and I would just like to add one of the most um, rewarding experiences uh, for me, and I think every member that I saw that day was just the opportunity to see each other in person. We have Agreed. missed so much, and everybody just had the best time uh, seeing um, our old friends and new friends. Um, on a beautiful day. And we saw lots of our former members as well. Many, many of our former members make a, make a special um, um, effort to go on our garden tours. So I, I think maybe that was my favorite part of the day. So again, celebration to all you know, for who, for the, you know, for, for the, for the volunteer effort that went into the day and then for the out, the outcome here of the, uh, you know, of the, of the income and the results, you know, very tremendous. So congratulations to all. And indeed we'll start, you know, cranking up for next year. Okay. So today we've got a full uh, agenda in terms of um, activities and programs we're going to be talking about. Um, it will be interesting in, in the recaps of the, at the, of the uh, Grace Harbor County Fair. Uh, Mike Carvia is with us here for uh, our Tapio More Than a Moment. Uh, Mike's going to be talking about, uh, you know, wildfire prevention and uh, firewise landscaping. Uh, as I've mentioned in some of the preamble to the to talk today, that uh, Mike's section on firewise landscaping is actually a highlight of the intern training. And so I wanted him to bring that to us today, especially that we're in the middle of fire season here. Uh, and it, uh, and of course, what a terrible fire season it's, uh, it's becoming. Let's kick off with the uh, August birthdays. But, uh, I get to celebrate my own birthday this month. And it, uh, it, uh, my sister just sent me a birthday card last week. She's, she never can remember when my birthday is, that's for sure. So, it, uh, it, uh, so it, uh, it's, a, it's a busy month that uh, a lot of it, uh, Pacific County at uh, birthdays here with Renee, Rachel, uh, myself. Uh, but we also see Jessica, Robin, Don, Wendy, Connie, and Bridget 
with birthdays in August. So a busy month indeed. Uh, and again, this is, uh, this is so odd for us to have an August meeting. Typically, we do not have an August foundation meeting because of the fairs. So uh, Zoom has now given us a facility to do an August meeting without uh, you know, undue burden on it, uh, on everyone. Anyway, happy birthday to everyone here in August. Now I begin with the to-dos and it, uh, this was interesting in noting the um, OSU, the Oregon State uh, uh, dates here. Interesting how they, uh, I just, in my question mark there is that this is what they said, this is an optimal date for establishing a new lawn, August through September. And I find, I find it interesting that they would pick these months, right? And cause, okay, yeah, we got the heat units, but man, you got to water like heck, you know, to get that lawn established. Uh, but yeah, that's what they're saying. This is the right time to get into uh, putting a new lawn in. Um, and uh, it's interesting also talking about termites and it, uh, this is when they're going to start uh, coming out. And it, uh, this is, you know, that's obviously a, a perennial problem for us here in Western, Western Washington. Watering, of course, best time to water early morning, water the soil rather than the leaves. So water the toes, not the nose, water deeply and infrequently. Interesting, camellias, deep watering to develop flower buds for next spring. Uh, recommendations on how to water your lawn. Hanging baskets, always an issue in terms of their drying out. Uh, lawn clippings do not compost if the lawn is treated right with these special um, the special weed and feed uh, fertilizers and of course don't compost disease plants unless using hot methods fertilizing cucumbers summer squash broccoli pruning the cherry trees before interesting uh, cherry trees before the fall rains to allow that callusing it's interesting how they they singled out cherry trees and not apples pears or plums uh, but they're at, uh, they were definitely at, uh, this, they definitely at uh, uh, OSU is definitely highlighting cherries as a pruning to happen now. Um, dead fruiting canes, of course, to be pruned out. Cane berries can be pruned. Um, you know, this is a uh, it's, it's an interesting question about uh, pruning um, of the canes of the cane berries uh, because from a wildlife perspective, from a pollinator perspective, a lot of those dead canes actually become very great uh, um, uh, insect nur uh, nursing uh, canes uh, for, for future years and for the fall. So from a wildlife perspective, you know, keeping those canes around, um, at least uh, putting them in a wood pile and so forth to be used by insects for, it, uh, you know, for pollinating, uh, to, uh, pollinating effect uh, does have benefit. Planting. Time to get going on winter uh, winter cover crops, and that again is just also bizarre to be thinking about, right? Uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, talking about uh, you know talking about winter gardens at the very time that we're thinking about here, um, the very time we're thinking about having um, you know uh, the, uh, a heat dome. Um, uh, interesting um, virus resistant varieties, uh, fall crops of cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli. Uh, and it's interesting in the coast, they had a specific note for the coast, this is the time to plant spinach. And of course, we've been planting spinach and doing spinach, uh, doing more spinach. Pest monitoring, um, a strong comment here about IPM uh, to, main sure, uh, to make sure that we're using chemical mm -hmm. controls only when necessary. Um, a lot of monitoring activity, they're calling for spotted wing dros uh, drosophila. Um, and it, uh, looking at that uh, pest as an issue to work with here. So our 2021 elected board, you know, just a reminder here is that uh, PJ has been elected as our interim president, carrying us through the Yay. year here. Yay, indeed, Sherry. <laughs> Glad for your enthusiasm. <laughs> we got a president. We have a president. That's very important indeed. And at, uh, PJ can't join us this morning. She's actually at uh, she's actually uh, working in one of her volunteer roles here. Um, but I wanted to bring up this slide, and of course that uh, we have Tony and Alina, you know, um, Han showing us uh, from the WSU program standpoint. But I wanted to bring up these uh, slides here because it's time to be thinking about uh, next year. And a reminder that we still have a gap and an opening for an additional coordinator. And so anyone out there who would like to participate in the, as a coordinator, um, this is definitely, we have a, uh, it's an honorarium funded position. 
uh, we would definitely, at, uh, you know, at, uh, uh, definitely value your participation because it's it's a it's a heavy load for uh, for Alina, uh, just as one. Um, I wanted to make a note here is that we have a nominating committee for our 2022 elected board. Per our bylaws, right, we will elect officers for 2022 calendar year 2022 in October. So at the October meeting, whether it be face to face or whether it be a Zoom, we will have an election for our 2022 board. Uh, these individuals are on a nominating committee being headed up by PJ. Uh, we, uh, you know, it, uh, every role is up for election. Uh, and we definitely want to ensure that as many people are considering these roles and considering stepping up and making this uh, and making this uh, program happen. I, I think everyone who has a current role understands that, you know, is that uh, we all succeed through the support of multiple volunteers. So I would like to feel that no single role is overwhelming and that there's lots of opportunity for support. So please consider, you know, where you might serve. And if not as an elected officer on a committee or in some other volunteer capacity. So reminder, of course, who we are as the foundation and as an officer of the foundation, we're here to form these three pro, you know, these three activities, uh, which is what which are spelled out in the bylaws as to why we are here. Uh, we educate and inform following research based information from WSU, OSU and Idaho. Uh, we fundraise for growth, as we've just evidenced with the garden tour. And of course, we come together to facilitate coming together to, uh, to, to learn and to uh, socialize and network. So that's our volunteer uh, shout out to make that happen for you all. Um, reminder, of course, registering your hours, recording your hours. Mary Shane admitted to me before the call that she's not recorded her hours since April, I think. So it, uh, she's got a long list of uh, recording the hours and getting into uh, give polls. Um, Alina, if you're on and have any comment here in terms of how are we doing with respect to overall, with respect to getting our hours recorded? Any comment you want to add? I think we're making progress. Uh, I have some things to add later on about this. Uh, but just continue to explore and noodle about and add your hours, your impact hours, and contact me if you have any questions. I'm making a special note of this now because, as Terry noted early on, there's 63 of our you know members that volunteered during the, the, the garden tour. So there's a significant number of hours that we can post uh, to give pulse here because of uh, our activities on July 24th. So reaching out for some announcements that uh, want to make sure folks have a chance to give, uh, 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 give all the news that's good to share. Helen, you must have something to share, some of the announcement to share, right? Aren't I? I better look. <laughs> Kelly? Yes, Cindy. Cindy. Yeah, I have. I, if, if Helen's doing some thinking right now, I just would uh, give you an update on the fair, which just ended on Saturday, the Grace Harbor County Fair. Uh, they had record daily visitor counts each day that the fair was open, and they, you know, they reduced the fair from five days to four days for this year. So just the fact that they had so many visitors was a, was a big plus. We had a, a pretty steady stream of, um, of visitors to the garden. Uh, lots of uh, good help there from the, for the master gardeners to, to visit with folks and uh, record plant clinic questions and, and uh, address those questions. So, um, and let's see what else, what I was going to tell you about that. We also had the, Gosh, it was, I think it was all, almost 90 kids coming through to do our our children's activity, which is which is a sizable bunch. We didn't get a count of people that came into the, into the garden this year, um, but we did. Uh, we just didn't have. We weren't set up to do it. So, anyways, but that's. I just wanted you to know that the fair was a great success. We had a lot of good comments on the garden and and just um, the, the folks in the garden. So, 
So, Cindy, it was interesting. You're noting that they had record attendance. And is that, yes. I guess part of it, of course, is that they didn't have a fair last year. You have That's pent right. up demand. That's part right. of it, of course, is that it was compressed, right? Yep. So fewer days. Yep. Um, it any, might be a heads up for Pacific County, you know, to, to be aware that that's going to happen for them as well. I hope it is. Any particular questions in terms of plant clinic? Is there any theme or trope that came up with respect to problems or issues or concerns, questions from the public? You know, Jude's going to have to answer that if she, if she is willing, um, because I didn't really, uh, I, I didn't feel the plant clinic questions. I was in the, you know, in the race beds running around visiting with folks. So. So, but she, but she fields and collects all the data on plant clinic stuff. So I don't know, Jude, did you have something? Is she, is she on? I, I don't see her on, but I'm wondering, is anybody else who served in the plant clinic there with Jude? Um, uh, uh, any any comments or questions? Maybe, is Garnet on? I was outside the plant clinic. I was mostly back in the compost area, but weeds. And, you know, weeds that we know like the back of our hand, like ivy, bindweed, scotch broom. People were asking about weeds? Okay. Interesting, Chris. So, so, so you know, it, uh, and so common weed problems typically coming from people who are new to the area or from established um, residents, established uh, populations. Established, but the other comment that I'd make this time is that we had more, I spoke to personally, more out of county people than I ever have in the past. I mean, King County people, Renton, you know, people from elsewhere seem to have flooded to this fair. That's true. There were a lot of people from outside of Grace Harbor County. You're right. No, and, and Chris also on, on that idea of the thing about the, the King County uh, folks there, there was a woman who stopped and asked, oh, what kinds of, what kinds of plants are good for the, the deer aren't gonna eat? You know, and I told her lavender and she said she was a, you know, and she laughed a little bit because that, that's a, a decent answer, but what do deer really not eat? But besides that, she said that she was uh, in the first graduating class of master gardeners out of King County in the in the mid 1970s. So, what a what a fun guest to have come visit our garden. Well, congratulations! It uh, indeed uh, the um, uh, I think you're you're coaching there on the fact that we should expect um, you know a, a large group coming to the Pacific County Fair is it uh, is well taken there. I hope so. Yeah. And Mike, I wonder if this is a quick a time for you to give a shout out for uh, your request for volunteers for that Pacific County Fair. Any comments, Mike? Well, we're looking for more people to sign up to staff the, the booth. We've got a good start right at the moment. We don't have any interns. And so here was a grand opportunity for to people to participate and meet uh, different people from a different area too. So looking forward to people signing up and get a hold of me if you have any questions and look forward to the uh, cooperation. It's a reminder then that the Pacific County Fair is a three-day event, right? And that'll be on the 26th, 27th, and 28th of this month. So yeah. we always make sure it's always at the hottest, most sultry and humid time. <laughs> so we can make it entirely, uh, entirely uncomfortable for the time. I just wanted to bring up something that Mike touched on that it doesn't matter whether it's a demonstration garden, a fair, or, or whatever activity, that just because you're in one location doesn't mean you, if you're in Grays Harbor County, you can always go to Ocean Shores or Pacific County to help or vice versa. It, it doesn't mean, just because you live in one place doesn't mean you only have to do your master gardener work in that one place, but most people already know that. We're not checking passports at the county border. That's right. <laughs> and again, congratulations. Other announcements? Kelly, this is Char. Char. Yes, I just want to add to what um, you were talking about the Pacific County Fair. I've worked there for several fairs and it's really a really a nice fair. And the people, all of the master gardeners are of course wonderful. So I would encourage anybody who wants to sign up to volunteer to please do, it's, it's good. It's a fun fair. 
and as that uh, as as Mike's going to note, uh, you know, we've uh, we're actually in a new position in that uh, in the 4-H building, and so it is closer mm. to the uh, it uh, it's uh, closer to the door and it's a uh, much larger space, so we've got plenty of room to stretch out and make things happen. Uh, this is Rick. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Rick. Uh, yeah. Uh, Katie and I are going to be on the radio station KBKW again next Monday at nine o'clock. Um, we will talk about uh, recruiting for the next class. If I get some information on that before next Monday, I guess I'll just go on the website. And uh, um, I just want to mention as in regards to the fair, uh, Cindy was being very immodest. Uh, um, we had a lot of questions on, of course, composting because Leroy Sisk was back there. Chris Kohler was back there. I was back there. Plus the rest of the garden. We had a lot of questions on growing vegetables and uh, growing vegetables for the food bank and telling everybody of all the plant starts we gave out to all the food banks. So we talked about it to a lot of people about a lot of topics out there and hopefully Jew will have most of that information recorded. Well, again, congratulations to all that supported on that uh, supported that fair. As 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 we've always noted that um, the the uh, that Elma Demo Garden is kind of our front door. It's kind of our uh, front facing, and the fact that thousands of people visit that garden every year during the fair is huge. And of course, it the, there's it's a year round effort to maintain that, as you, Rick, and certainly you, Cindy, know. <laughs> but congratulations on making sure the garden is at its prime during the fair but we had a lot of people walk through that garden um, you know the fair attendance was big and the people kept on coming in and we were open later this time until six o'clock and Leroy was there after six o'clock so we had we contacted a lot of people a lot of all of which got recorded on uh, Jude's notes but uh, we had a big attendance in the garden there Congratulations again. That is just, it, it is just a big deal. And we should, uh, we should, uh, it's uh, the, the fact that it's free, the fact that it's very visible, the fact that we as master gardeners are there to respond to questions and to be friendly and approachable, uh, uh, you know, as, as ambassadors for the program, it's a big deal. And we were very friendly and very approachable because there was a lot of people walking around at all times approaching everybody. Other announcements? Is this the time, Kelly, for me to just do my little thing about uh, what I wanted to say about program coordinators? I think that'd be great. Okay. So you've all been waiting with bated breath to find out when we're going to be able to see what out, a summary of the hours that we've been doing and what categories, program categories they're in. That's now pretty much figured out by give pull support it's going to be part of the and you know entering out entering impact hours um but just to caveat make sure that when you're entering your hours on give pulls make sure you enter a start and an end time and make sure that that shows am or pm the appropriate am or pm and of course the date and then there was a pull down menu for choosing the program category, you know, CE or demo garden or whatever. And if you don't do that, then you won't be able to get a, a printout of what, where your hours go in which category. Um, we're also looking at program priorities this year, which include like uh, fire, um, fire prevention and other things that if it's appropriate, you can use. Are you going to bring that up? No, go ahead. No, just, I'm just bringing this up here. That's all. Yeah. So program priorities are new this year and, uh, you can add those as appropriate and you can add more than one program priority. Um, so you can do nearby plants and water conservation, you know, whatever applies. And then once this whole thing rolls out, I'll send you step-by-step -step instructions on how to access your print summary. Um, and that'll be this month. And then the other thing is I put a lot of information in the e-news, but 
with the spike in COVID-19 cases, WSU is really highly encouraging everyone, regardless of whether they've had vaccinations or not, to wear a facial covering indoors. And masking is required of all people when youth are the target audience or when youth will be present. So uh, if, you're, if you're having a plant clinic, um, you have to wear a mask even if you're vaccinated or not vaccinated because you know that families will be coming. But anyway, read your e-news because that's one of the uh, forums that I use to give you updates on what WSU is saying for COVID-19 guidelines and they change. And then um, John Kugan will also be sending out updates to our members regarding any changes if it's not timely to get in the e-news. That's all I have to say. Any questions for Alina regarding masking and regarding um, regarding those that that uh, regarding COVID guidelines at present? I, I expect Alina that we might see changes in those guidelines. You know, as you know, as in the coming days or weeks, right? As a as as the situation changes with De with Delta, right. I have a question. I noticed that uh, the Grace Harbor Fair, nobody was wearing a mask around all the children that they were leading. Well, that will change for Pacific County. So, John, you're not talking about the Master Gardener. Yeah. The Master Gardener <laughs> yes, the Master Gardener uh, garden. Yeah. Well, most of the Master no, we Gardener wore our masks. their masks. Well, well, I saw some pictures I got from Helen that uh, showed children and the adults around them didn't have masks on and they were master gardeners. Well, it would be, okay. That's quite possible that that happened, but most of us wore our masks. Uh, I'm not sure that those were master gardeners that you saw in some of those pictures. Uh, the one picture where we took off our masks, but there were no children in it, were with Carol. Um, and the the picture that I, uh, okay, I'll go back and look at the pictures too. Yeah, just just be careful what you're looking at, John. But but John, rest assured that uh, at the Pacific County Fair, we will be indoors, and we were, you know, and I, I fully expect that we'll all be masked, uh, you know, regardless of uh, regardless of status. Well, that's great, but it sounds like you've uh, figured that the coronavirus is a thing of a past, but that's not true. Well, I know one member of our group has maybe caught caught it after the Grays Harbor Fair. Oh no! Yeah. Well, you know, mask indeed are are you know, and mask and and uh, and, uh, and proper proper COVID protocol is definitely going to be intently watched. Um, so we'll definitely be looking for your emails, John, relative to WSU guidance as they follow. Uh, the state guidance, which is uh, certainly changing. I want to add almost nobody besides master gardeners was masked at that fair. Yeah. I went to the races afterwards and absolutely no one was wearing a mask, but me. Uh -huh. That's the way it um, I'd like to add that my son-in-law has COVID and he has been vaccinated. So, um, He's not in the hospital or anything, but he got really sick. So it happens. We need, still need to be careful. This is Karen talking. Most certainly, Karen. And by the way, our best wishes for your son-in-law, uh, because indeed breakthrough cases will, uh, will occur, as we know. Well, he caught it from his daughter, who was too young to be vaccinated. So My granddaughter. To that effect, uh, we definitely know that the state conference coming up at the end of September, right, will be all virtual, and it uh, and uh, and so that they they uh, they wisely planned months ago, right, to have the state conference be a uh, uh, be a virtual event this year. The website up there at the top, mglearns.org, is where you can go to sign up. Um, Karen, since you're on the phone here, Aaron, who am I, and Sharon, any comments from yourselves as to the state conference? Uh, do, do we have any sense for how many people from our foundation have signed up to participate? 
I don't know. This is Karen, but um, we would like to have some people um, donate items for the online auction. Um, each county is supposed to try to get some items, um, items that don't need to be gift certificates are especially welcome because then they don't need to be shipped. Okay. So will, will you be reaching out or you're just kind of reaching out, just suggesting here that anybody that has some ideas get, get in contact with you? That would be great. Any of us. Yes, yeah. Sharon or Aaron. Yes. Yeah. Or me. Yeah, we're doing some soliciting of businesses related to gardening. Yeah. I want to make a definite, just a personal shout out to everybody that, because uh, this is a great way to get your continuing education hours in. Yes. And it's going to be, a, it's just, this is, you know, you can't, it can't get more convenient, right, than to have this, uh, this kind of virtual access. So uh, at this point, I would hope everyone has enough skill with Zoom that they would be very comfortable going to this, uh, going to this, uh, this conference experience. So uh, at, uh, this is, there's no excuse in my mind for not getting your continuing education hours in for this year. <laughs> well, you've already supplied a lot of them for us. Well, we're just, yeah. We're we're trying to keep that we're trying to keep that going, yeah. But this is this is going to be quality training, you know, quality learning. Oh, absolutely, is going yeah. yes. So don't don't miss that opportunity. Now, speaking of opportunities, one of the discussions we've been having amongst uh, just amongst some of the emails here is that um, uh, how do we make sure that all of our master gardener colleagues, right, are doing well during this time. Uh, I mean, there's 28 of us here on this Zoom call today, and that's great. Our e-news goes out to many, many more. Um, but it's the, the question of reaching out and connecting with people who may not be, uh, you know, have, uh, have access to, uh, to, 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 to Zoom or may not be um, equipped to engage. This is, um, uh, I, I just want to put this reach out here, is that you have on the roster, right? You have the roster that we distribute to everybody, all the contact information for all of our members. And a shout out here to anyone that can reach out to folks that know they need just, hey, just a call, a text, a visit, see how they're doing. You know, it, uh, we're coming on to, uh, you know, well over a year and a half of this COVID experience. And as John noted, we're far from out of the woods on this. So it is uh, time to make sure that we really are doing all we can to make sure our MG colleagues are healthy, are being thought of. Um, if there's any needs, concerns that they have that we might be able to assist, um, all it needs is a call. Any comments or questions from anyone on this? I have a question. Um, it's directed to Elena. Can you hear me? We yeah. can. Great. Um, when there, will there be a new roster? Okay, you know what? I have been working on a roster. I was going to send it out today or earlier this week, and I keep getting people contacting me saying things have changed. So I, every time I get ready to send it out, then today I found out that somebody's phone number had changed. So, uh, you know, I'm working on it. I'm just, I, I'm thinking, okay, should I send it out last week and then send out another one with three new changes? Or, you know, if I can get through a couple days with no more changes, then I'll send it out. Uh, okay, could you tell me who Valerie Savisky is? Yeah, she's here. Yeah. Hi, Valerie. Um, you're not on the roster, so I'm wondering, where did you come from? I am on the roster and Elena, you don't have my birthday there now that I know that Kelly announces them every month. I was certified in Kitsap County in 2019, spent a year in Lane County, and now I'm in Grace Harbor County and I hope I can settle down. I'm too old to be too big so much. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm looking at an April 8th version. Oh, the, oh uh, I came I came in in October and contacted Elena in February, I think it was, or March. So yeah, I'll send it out again, Mary. Okay. But I do have Mary? a request. 
Um, Etta Bondi right now is not reachable. Her mail is returning undeliverable and her <laughs> phone, her, her uh, phone number, her message box is full. And I'm going to call Tracy today. Uh, she's in charge of 4-H and some yeah. of Etta's relatives, I guess, grandchildren or whoever are in 4-H. But it's really concerning to me that she has just sort of dropped off the radar and nobody, yeah. nobody that I've contacted knows anything. So if you know something, a way to reach Etta, or if you know the names of relatives that I could contact, please email me because I really want to um, work this out. So a shout out there for anyone that knows Eddie, Etta. Eddie. Uh, I do know Etta. This is Rick again. And uh, Elizabeth visited, uh, took her 20 year pin out to her house. She lives on DK Road, uh, north of Hoquiam there. And uh, I know, uh, I know uh, Aberdeen Realty was possibly going to sell her house last year. So I don't know if there's been a change in that regards or not, but uh, um, I'll try to look into it. Thank you, Richard, because I know that Elizabeth went out there to give her her 20 year pin, but this has been just in the last month. Elizabeth and I have both tried to reach her oh, unsuccessfully. Okay. So again, it's a good comment for all of us just to be thinking about others that we may know and that we may know that uh, could use a could use a helping hand. So let's just uh, you know, at, uh, 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 Alina, we look forward to an updated roster. Uh, you know, as, as soon as as soon as possible, it'd be great just to reach out. And I would encourage everyone to think about finding a buddy or two on that roster and reach out to them, see how they're doing. Just check in. Okay, another comment I want to make is that uh, is is this uh, is the reminder about phishing, um, because we're all online all the time now. Uh, there's a lot of emails that are coming in on the phone and in email. Uh, the bottom line here is if you don't recognize the email address coming in, right? Don't open it, and certainly don't open attachments if there's any question at all as to what's uh, as to what's coming in. Uh, 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 Ron Solson had, uh, had passed an email just this past week to us, indicating that he suspected that uh, some of our uh, some of our own uh, 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 email list have, may have been compromised and may be used as part of a phishing scam. Um, it's just a simple matter of uh, of of, ig of uh, ignoring and deleting immediately any emails that look um, uh, that look uncomfortable and in unfamiliar. Similarly, um, you know, this is a, a, I've had this slide up here in a couple of meetings here. Uh, there are gift card scams that are, con that are, that are out there all the time. Uh, and please make sure that you're monitoring, uh, you know, you're monitoring, uh, 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 you're, you're making sure that, again, that nothing you open and nothing you respond to is done by anyone that's, uh, that's going to, uh, that's, that, that you don't understand the, who they are. To that point, it is in it, uh, the, your email applications, the email updates that Microsoft is putting out, Yahoo is putting out and so forth. They're becoming increasingly vigilant on trying to find scam and uh, uh, scammer emails. And so it's possible that the emails that you want to be receiving from Alina, from John, uh, from Katie, right, may be getting blocked because your email application may think that you're receiving a scam email. Um, and so this slide is here just to make note that you can whitelist or block uh, folks that you want to, uh, to receive email from or not receive email from. And uh, it just the easiest way to do this, just to go to YouTube and just Google in your search in YouTube, uh, whom, you know, how to whitelist an email address in Yahoo, how to whitelist an email address in Outlook. So there's ways to get this done so that you ensure you do not miss an email from John or Katie or from Alina. So very important that that, uh, that, that be, be thoughtful on that. Okay, 
Now, tentatively, tentatively, we're hoping to have a picnic next month on Saturday, September 11th, an auspicious date indeed, but we wanted to pick a Saturday. And, uh, but indeed, we're going to be tentative at this point, um, given where we stand with, uh, uh, with COVID. So, uh, you know, stay tuned for what we may or may not be able to do at that time. Okay. Mike, I want to turn over to you. I'm going to stop uh, my sharing here and give you an opportunity to share. By introducing uh, Mike, I want to make sure that folks know that uh, he's just recently retired from Pacific County as a firefighter. And it, uh, one of the exciting things that we've all uh, really enjoyed in working with Mike is that he's been very gracious in gifting of his uh, time and his experience and talking about how to work with fire, uh, you know, in the landscape. Um, and he's, he's done a very enjoyable time, by the way, with the intern training. Mike, over to you. Okay, let's see here. Are we able to see that, Kelly? Not quite yet. So I have, let me see here, the screen share component on there. Go down to share screen. Okay, go got it. Click on the little green button and then pick the window that you want to share. It's coming. There it is. Shazam, we got it. Okay. Outstanding. Okay. Karen, you need to go on mute. Um, go ahead. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Kelly's given me a 20 minute opportunity to do a refresher about the, the Firewise uh, program that is out there and some of what we can do as master gardeners. So there'll be two parts to today's presentation. And the, the first part will be, we'll talk about your home landscaping, fire behavior. And then I send additional information to Kelly I'd come across through Washington State University about uh, your respiratory health and what you can do to make a difference for your health inside your own home. And again, as Kelly had said, I'm a retired firefighter. I graduated from the class of 2014 from the Master Gardener, and it's just been a, a great experience ever since then. So the we'll talk about, again, we'd already talked about the landscaping decisions, building construction, and this is all about you, something that I can what I can bring to the forefront is what you can do to make a difference. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, fire behavior. And when we talk about it, there's the, the big three when it com comes to the fire environment. So of course the weather is absolutely huge. And then where do you live? Do you live at the top of a hill uh, where fire may go up the hill? We'll see some pictures of that. And what type of fuel is around you? Whether it's just simple grass, um, vegetation, and we'll talk about the whether the fuel has to be alive or dead to be able to burn. So when we talk a look about the uh, the big three, so what is the weather? It's hot, it's dry, it's windy. There you go. There is the whole presentation right there. So the hotter that it is, the um, the, the drier that the fuel will be too, and the wind makes a, a big part in what, how is the fire going to proceed? And we'll see pictures later on where you'll see where the, the fire will burn against the wind. And we'll talk about some more about the fire behavior on that. So then the topography and if, take a look at where you live. Do you live at the top of a hill? Uh, do you have a narrow drainage, which will increase the rate of the, uh, the fire spread? How steep is it? The increase the rate of the fire. And so we, I think that looking at this picture that the fire started from probably from spotting on the left, because you don't see where the fire is leading up. We see at the head of the fire. And so it's probably due to radiation, convection, uh, flying embers that are going around. And we'll talk a little bit more about some problems that you have in your area. And if you start seeing ash falling around you, there's a pretty good sign that you have a problem uh, somewhere in the, in the distance. 
Well, let's take a look at uh, aerial rules. So here we have just a great example of the fuel that's up at the top of the trees. We're talking about branches, moss, snags, uh, the very top of the crown of the tree. We can see that we have, for the most part, a live forest. And the, the forest, a uh, common misconception is, is that it has to be dead to burn. And that is so far from the truth. The heat, the dryness of the fuel, the fire, the direct flame contact. So even the green vibrant growth will burn. So here we have from the fire, this radiant heat energy. We have the convection. And here's where you're going to get what's called crowning, is that wind takes that convection, then drying out the fuel in front of it, this fire just races across the top of the trees. And probably one of the most feared places to be is underneath it where the fire is burning over your head. And uh, so the firefighters are trained real well to watch out for this. So here we have an extreme view of the fire all the way at the top of the trees. And I'll show another picture of crowning of what happens at our local level at the grasses that we have too. So it doesn't always have to be tall. We can see with the fire and the aerial fuels, lots of smoke, lots of uh, the just incredibly intense fire. And remember that this is at the top of the trees. Now we have some of the embers and burning debris falling down, which is going to start the fire underneath. And we'll talk about the torching effect also. And with a top of the uh, aerial fuels like this, we have lots of lumens. We have lots of light coming from this because we have the air right there and we have such a com good, complete combustion. So another fire that we have are surface fuels. This is everything that's sitting on top of the ground, grass, shrub, timber, litter, logging slash. And again, it, it doesn't have to be dead. Green grass growth will burn. And we see this all often with some of the mega fires, especially the fire in California, which I believe is now the biggest one in their history. It's evolved that far into it. So we, we've taken a look at some pretty extreme fires. So how about if we just tone it down a little bit? And let's just bring it home. And we had talked about the crowning of the fire. So here we have a dune fire, obviously. And we can see the blackness of the fire that's burned. But look at the brown of the unburned fuel. This fire raced across the landscape. And all of this will burn again because all the fuel has not been consumed. So here's a good example of some torching, of the crowning of the, uh, not torching, but the crowning of the, uh, the fires going across the top of the landscape and just going so fast, makes it pretty challenging to keep up with the fire at times. So we had also talked a, a bit about the embers and the wind direction, the ash falling around you, and it, even if it could be a neighbor burning next door, whether it's a, a, a recreational fire or they have a permit to burn, uh, when you start having ash falling around you, you need to have your spidey senses need to kick in and you need to be on your alert because true and ash, for the most part, is a complete burned particulate, solid particulates that's floating through the air. But some of those embers, some of those ash have a little bit of life left in them. And as more of that comes in, it could start a fire. So there's your sign. You start seeing uh, ash falling around you, figure out what's going on and, and be on, on your, the tip of your toes because something's happening. This is such a cool picture. This is one of my favorite pictures. I just absolutely love this. It's just a great example of the, of the, uh, the root system. And so a subsurface fire is where the fire, somebody has built a campfire, maybe underneath the tree, the fire is into the death. They may have poured gallons and gallons of water on it when they're done, but that fire, that heat will get into the root system and it'll travel underground. And those are the fires that are a lot of work. And they'll smoke and smoke and just keep going. And um, 
so there, there's a lot of digging here. Very seldom are there flames in something like this, but, but lots of smoke and people will um, call it in saying, I don't see any fire, but I see lots of smoke. And then again, maybe they had a campfire underneath the tree and it got into the death. Defensible space, what can you do? What you can talk, we can talk about the defensible space. Look at this, we had a fire, they had a fire that burned 360 degrees all around the property, but look what they did. They had cleared around the home. There's two parts to this defensible space. One of them is it's to stop the fire from coming back. And the other part is a place where firefighters can work. Pardon where me? you can work, how are you? keep it Good. back. How are you? Were you at Margaret's earlier? Yeah, okay. okay, thank you. So we can see the landscaping, the rock, the mulch, even though that they've got greenery around their house, they had cleared out past that and all of that just made a difference. So that extra effort just stopped that fire. And I'm sure it was a pretty intense situation there seeing that fire burn all the way around them. And then here's where they're looking out for embers, whether they evacuated, whether they stood their ground and had sprinklers on the roof, but that greenery helped out. And then the clear minimum of 30 feet is what we want to keep in mind. Everybody's place is different. It may work, it may not work. And of course, the gravel road that we see there is a nice defensible space there, barrier coming across. But again, that doesn't stop the embers from coming over onto your property and the uh, embers being blown into the foundation vents, the roof vents, so you still are open windows, so you still have a lot of problems. We take a look at mowing the grass. Yes, it is okay to mow that grass, but as we take a look at this doom fire that had swept across the landscape, what stopped it was we can see where the grass was mowed up against the grass that was not mowed. And the, the biggest problem that we have is when the fire gets into the pine trees with the uh, pine needle litter and all of the uh, duff that's underneath it where you'll have this extreme torch happen and then that all those embers are carried downwind and we can see where we were able to get it just in the nick of time to keep it out of the trees but the trees end up being a, a pretty big problem for us so even though we take a look at the grass on the, the far right of the picture that grass will burn even though you have um, a close cut cropped lawn that may look like a crew cut, but all that grass is dead, it'll still burn. We've been at fires at places where they had a fire pit, had a campfire, an ember got out, and it will slowly creep across your lawn, even though you only have one inch or an inch and a half stubble, but all of that will burn. Here's another good example of the, the fire spread was stopped by the mow, mowed grass uh, and the fire burned right up against the house. They would have been nice if they would have had more of a cleared out area, but we got there in time and uh, to be able to make that difference. So I'm not quite sure what happened with this picture. You know, they, that 30 foot defensible space, they've got a nice area there for maybe horseshoes or lawn or badminton, but we can see where the fire had burned up to that cleared area and had stopped, but now it's starting to creep around towards the house. Well, we see that we still have a lot of tall grass to the house, cedar siding, um, and then the, the wooden deck that's on there. So what you can do is take a look at your house. Where is the vegetation at? What is it that you can do to be able to clear the majority of that problem out to buy yourself time or to elim totally eliminate the hazard? So take a look at your landscaping. Take a look at the topography. Where is your house? Uh, look at problems that there are, and it's not so much visualizing the destruction, it's vis visualizing the path of the fire, which is what I did in the fire department. Um, I would take a look at if a fire was to start right here, where would it go? Where's uphill? Where's the wind? And what is it that we have going against me? What difference can I make in taking a look at that?
So Mike, just on that point, I want to break, because that's a great shot there, right? You know, you've just indicated, right? Just going back to that last one, you've just indicated that uh, what you'd be looking at that property and you'd be thinking about predominant wind direction, uh, fuel source, uh, uh, risk of activities. What recommendations would you make to this homeowner with respect to their defensible space? Well, asking them to, to take off their wooden deck and their wooden siding isn't practical, of course. But what they can do is they can go in and cut that dune grass. That is not modification of the dunes or the tall grass. So they can take a weed eater. They can go in and cut that down and get that vegetation. You can see where they've got a nice concrete foundation and getting that vegetation down uh, away so that that fire isn't burning right up to the property, right up to the deck. And now you have um, direct flame contact is, is uh, more of a problem right now because of that fire, but they can extend that um, that defensible space around them and make a difference. We The picture is looking north and we can see how the grass has swept to the left, to the north there. So the predominant weather coming from the south. And as we take a look, so that would be my main focus is looking to the south. What is there? What is it that I can do? Okay, so here we have, uh, this is a pretty impressive fire. Um, but believe it or not, where the brown meets the green, that is not where the fire started. The fire started way far to the left of it, and the fire will burn against the wind because that fire, the, the flames are drying out the fuel behind it, even though the wind's burning the other direction. And so that fire, even though will burn, will just continue to burn um, even though uh, the, the wind may not give it that direction you want. So it's really deceiving on here, but there isn't much of a fire break around here. They've got a little bit, the path is not a good enough fire break to uh, the foot traffic path from the, the road out to the ocean isn't a good enough. And so this was a true save on this house. That fire, fire all fires will go out, uh, one way or another, they'll whether it's human intervention or they run out of fuel, but all fires will go out. But on something like this, it's here's where we have to make a difference. Wow. Okay, so it's not always a campfire, and it's not always an illegal burn, uh, anything like that, lightning. So here we have a gentleman who was drunk. Tried driving from the ocean through the dune grass and to up onto G Street and God's truck high centered catalytic converter burns. I want to say like at uh, 12, 1400 degrees and that when they're not operating correctly could be double that amount. But anyways, so it was hot enough underneath that vehicle or caught the dune grass on fire burned up the truck. And here was a true save of two houses uh, being able to get in there just in the nick of time. Uh, and to be able to, because here we have the dune grass pretty close to the house. Uh, we've got railroad ties. We can see on the right hand side, the, um, the, the trees and the bushes there suffered uh, some damage. And then here's the impressive part. Here's the vehicle that was actually on fire. Somebody had taken that picture. Now, even though that was an empty lot between two houses, um, it did make a difference. We can see the fire would burn up to the lawn and stop at that point. So that radiant heat energy, that smoke column. And again, the guys did a great job. It was a, a good save. So we take a look at the, uh, the siding on your house and here's vinyl siding. Well, vinyl siding isn't very friendly to heat. If these folks would have cut the, the, the little pine trees and the grass back, they probably wouldn't have had that significant of a damage. But with that heat 
and what's coming up to be able to melt that plastic on there. We also have to worry about the curtains on the other side of the window. If those curtains catch fire, then we've got an in, we, we actually had to do forcible entry inside the house and take a look and make sure the, the curtains weren't too hot and smoking. So we, we opened up the curtains and made sure the fire hadn't progressed inside. But taking a look at what you can do, if you've got vinyl siding, maybe you need to take extra steps to be able to get vegetation back and try to figure out what is it you can do to protect your investment. A lot of people are get bent out of shape with the, uh, the propane tank and uh, against there. But to me, the, the pile of wood is the biggest threat. Propane tank, we walk around, do a 360 around the homes. We just shut them off to shut off the propane tank. They're relatively safe unless the entire structure was on fire. Uh, propane tanks will vent themselves, but there's other threats that are on there that are a, a bigger threat. So what can you do? How is the road to your house? Uh, do you have good access for fire trucks, brush trucks, water tenders to be able to get in, turn around, conduct operations and get out? And, you know, the fire service, the fire department, we, we don't have an obligation to tear our light bar off and our mirrors off to get down to your place. So there may be times where we have to do what's called hand jacking, hand jack a fire hose down there and fight fire from a distance, uh, which we've had to do before. So what can you do? Take a look at your road going in. Is there something you can do to reduce the, uh, the over to uh, maximize the overhead clearance? the siding on, uh, on the sides to be able to get a, a fire apparatus in there. And if you have any questions, contact the fire department, have them come out and get take a look at it. So, you know, why entire neighborhoods burn down, house after house after house, and you see it, here's the only one standing. Uh, California, Fire Department of, uh, oh goodness sakes, can't remember the department's name, but they had published this extensive exam uh, data on houses that had burned. Why did it burn? Why did it not burn? And what happened? And so this exhaustive report that they did, it was, it was just really super interesting. And the uh, building construction codes, that was the number one reason that stopped their houses from burning down, building construction codes and people not cheating the system, terracotta tile, cement board siding. Uh, number two was landscaping. What can you do with the landscaping to stop that? And probably the most astounding fact that they presented was luck. Luck was a contributing factor in there. The wind changed direction at the right time. Uh, something happened, but luck was, they, it was just, they couldn't give it a, a good reason for it. So defensible space. We have a defensible space here. You can see the retaining walls were just huge in this. The house in the, at the top of the picture, the retaining wall was just huge. The house down below, uh, the retaining wall out front, the, uh, the parking area that they had. And so here we have fire that, if we take a look, burned 360 degrees around there. And they were able to save their, their houses through uh, defensible spaces that they had created. Here's another one, fire burned 360 degrees around. Why? The house kind of sits in a hole, you got metal siding, probably cement, or excuse me, metal roof, cement board siding. Um, minimal defensive space around there, everything's burned up. There wasn't a lot of fuel it didn't take a look like, but it doesn't take much for a number to get into your house. Another defensible picture of a defensible space that works. Here they have the road that's coming in. They've cleared out area around it and the fire burned all the way around the property and they still have everything standing. Uh, well, I'm not going to show this one. This is a, a really cool video uh, George Hill, Hill Towing had taken of a fire that we had. You see the fire racing across the landscape. You see one wildland brush truck show up there and put the fire out so we can see the direction. So I'm not going to show that one at all. So a good site to review for more information is firewise.org. 
And that one is a, a lot of information on it. And we, so we, excuse me, like that. Uh, before I go any further onto the next segment about your health, do we have any questions? Okay, if there's no questions, then I'll continue on with the second part. So a reminder for everyone is that you can temporarily unmute yourself by holding down your space key. So if indeed you have a question, um, and don't hesitate to use chat as well. Okay, so here we are. So I, I came across an article in uh, mynorthwest.com uh, featuring local news that is uh, had happened in, in the across Washington State and in, in our area. And they had a good article in there, don't wait for the skies to turn hazy to prepare for wildlife, wildfire smoke. And so I'm taking a look at this, read this, and I go through, and they had a really good segment put on by Washington State University on what can you do for your respiratory health in your house. So some of the things to take a look at are, you know, the signs and symptoms that we may have a problem with our with the smoke that's in our area. And we could have uh, itchy or burning eyes, sore throat, headache, nausea. When you start having that because of the smoke, here's where you need to get to clean air. So you need to focus and make sure that you are uh, aware of what's going on. Now, we were really, really fortunate on the coast area here by not having the impact of smoke from the fires burning in California, Oregon, Washington. We were just blessed to have the, the wind blowing uh, from the ocean blowing in, and we didn't have that problem. I've got a good friend of mine that lives in Tenasket, and I was talking to him, hey, how are you surviving? He's going, well, we're, we're doing okay. It was 106 today, and we were noted as having the worst air quality in Washington State, or actually in the nation. Uh, they, and he's saying, it is so hard. I've lived here all my life, and this is the worst it's been. You go outside, it's so gosh darn hot, and I can't breathe. My, my eyes are running because of all the smoke. And, and again, we were just blessed not to have that problem there. So again, when you start having some of these signs and symptoms, uh, we need to pay attention on what is it that you are going to do. So we know that a lot of groups of people that are most susceptible are people uh, really over the age of 65. You've got an underlying health condition, longer heart disease, uh, pregnant women, infants are going to have a problem with this. So if you're part of that sensitive population, um, we need to figure out what's going on. Call 911, go for help. And so you need to have a plan. What are you going to do when the smoke comes in? And it's going to happen again for us. Um, Kelly had mentioned earlier, we have another, whether it's a heat dome or another heat episode, but we're in for another long stretch of dry weather coming up and there's going to be some more fires. So again, the, the whole point of this conversation is what happens if it gets smoky and you are having respiratory issues? Uh, do you temporarily relocate? Do you go someplace else? Do you um, try to uh, buy yourself some time? But a lot of people, we don't have that uh, ability to be able to do that. So then if, if you close all your doors and windows, protect in place, if you have central air conditioning, put the air on, recirculate, and make sure you've got a good quality filter. And I, this was a great learning experience for me that there are the three different types of filters. And you have the 10, 8, and 6, and it's just a numerical value assigned to the better quality um, filters and some that are not as good a quality. When we see that we have a six, that's more for dust and lint. A eight would be allergen, and then a 10 would be allergen pro, but that one also takes, that's the one that takes care of smoke. So of course, good, better, best, and the price goes up accordingly. So there's a financial part in there, but here's what you can do with a filter in your own home system, in your uh, central air system. And if you don't have a system like this, here's what you can do adding one to a box fan. 
So here I have my fan and I have my filter every, and we do some redneck engineering and we just take simple duct tape and duct tape the filter to the fan and place this inside your house. Now you can put it in a window if you wanted to, but if you have a lot of smoking conditions, you're gonna have your door shut, your window shut. How can I filter the air inside my home? Here was a very simple way of doing it. Just taking a filter and a fan and taping it to this. Key component is pay attention. You have an arrow for the direction of airflow. So if you're going to use this um, inside the house trick in filtering the air, make sure you pay attention to the arrow that's on the, the screen there. Make sure you get the right filter for inside the house and pick up a roll of duct tape if you need uh, something like that, be able to make it work. And, and all of that will make a difference. Now, Kelly will provide a link at the very bottom from the Washington State University uh, person that has showing an example of this, and he'll show you the filter he's in, that was in his house. He'd taken it off, and how dirty is it? Really does work inside your house, and it's not just an example of what can you do for um, for the smoke problem that there is, but for allergy season too, that this would work in that regard. Mike, on that, is it on on that home? On the, on the redneck engineering of, of, of this thing, would you put the filter on the, uh, which side of the fan would you put it on for optimal results? To put it on the, uh, the, the direction that the fan is blowing out and putting it on through here. Now, depending on the makeup of your fan, is it going to be a critical fail? Here I have got my cord is in the back is it going to be a fail to put it on the back side or the front side? It, it isn't going to be a fail putting that on there and letting that air um, go through your filter. And I believe that the gentleman has, I, and I can't remember, to be honest with you, on which side of the fan that he had recommended. So I, I'm letting you down in that regard. But getting the, uh, the, the right filter for the right application is going to set you up for success in your home. Questions, comments for Mike? This is a, obviously, it is, it is significant because it, as Mike noted, uh, you know, we're coming into some more warm weather. There will be more fires. Uh, respiratory issues for all of us are of genuine concern. Okay, well, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak in front of everybody again, and thanks for your support. Very good. Hey, so thanks, thanks everyone here for the uh, for joining here today. Um, get back to uh, where I need to be here. So um, do this here, and I'm going to go ahead and. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start.